grocers to allow them to compete with Amazon, Walmart, Target, and Kroger. And today we're talking about how to inspire the next generation workforce. Before we get started, a little housekeeping. The National Grocers Association has this antitrust statement. It's, they are committed to complying with antitrust laws. Therefore, we ensure compliance of the board of directors. Members, staff must refrain from engaging in discussion that may result in antitrust violations, such as agreements to fix prices or margins, allocate markets, engage in product, supplier, or customer boycotts, and refusal to deal with industry members. The NGA appreciates your compliance with the law as the board and members engage in association board meetings, education programs, and other activities to advance your competitiveness in today's market. That was a mouthful. Today's agenda, we're gonna be talking about the topics that as people leaders, as cultural leaders, we need to be focusing on today. I wanna to set a little bit of context with our panelists around the Great Recession, how local groceries world has and continues to evolve Introducing that next generation of employees to your stores. What are they bringing? What are they thinking about? What do they care about? We're going to get some stories from our panel about how they have been evolving through this process and how independents can attract young workers. We're going to kind of demystify what is working and what isn't working and try to apply it to your businesses so when you come back from NGA, you can take these learnings and go right to work as you build your team in the months and years to come. To start off, let's introduce our panel. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves. We've got a little slide in the background. Bob, take us away. Hi, everyone. Bob Ryman, president of Dice Supermarkets. We're a seven store family owned chain, fourth generation, um, celebrating 99 years today. We have stores in Connecticut, Massachusetts, and our happy uh, Rose customer. And, and Bob, before we pass over to Alexa, I just want you to talk a little bit about locals equals sure. local equals fresh, and also just talk about the way that you think about social media and tying what's going on in the store to your digital outreach efforts as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, as part of a member of IJ and the Independent Grocers Alliance, we really embraced, embraced the local equals fresh concept and kind of took that into our branding in the last several years. And a lot of what we were doing in the store was carrying local items, but we were doing a, a terrible job of communicating that to our uh, customers and also some of our employees. They didn't know where these items came from. So we used a lot of for signage. We brought that through our digital ad, um, our website, and then also through social media with people, mainly myself, going out into you know, farms, factories, whatnot, getting the story of all the people locally who are producing and growing stuff and you know, telling that to our customers. And that really helped kind of bring things together um, and close the gap with all of our customers to know like, that we really are local and we don't just you know say it like a lot of other people, but we're actually going there and vetting these people and getting the real stories and finding out what's going on in our communities. One of the things that you'll find when you look at Geisler's social media is their passion for food, right? Food is intimate. It's one of the few products we put in our body. We care about it. We use it to nourish our family and our friends. And when Bob is doing the social media campaign, the passion for food and the people that work at Geisler's and the community they serve just comes out. And that creates this level of energy and enthusiasm that becomes infectious with the staff, but also with the employees. So speaking of infectious enthusiasm, I'm passing that to Alexa Dash, fourth generation grocer from Buffalo, New York. Alexa, tell us a little bit of Dash this morning. Hi guys, I'm Alexa. Um, my family owns and operates a fourth generation grocery store. Um, we're from Buffalo, New York. Um, we have a lot of family ties, so we've got a little a loan that infused into our markets. Um, we like to specialize in meat, prepared food. Um, we have cafes directly in our stores, and our main focus is our relationship with our shoppers and um, making them feel like they're you know at home when they come into our store. So I want to talk a little bit about Alexa's grocery bona fides for a minute, but I'll do it for a story about her father's father. So many individuals will say they've been born into the grocery industry, and they may come a little bit metaphorically, but actually Alexa's grandfather was literally born into the grocery industry. Her grandmother gave, I guess, her great-grandmother gave birth to her grandfather on a sack of flour in the back of the store. <laughs> on a sack of flour in the back of the store. And then what did she do after? She, she went to the hospital and she came back to work. <laughs> <laughs> so that's about as, as hardcore as it gets for retail and grocery in terms of uh, commitment to the purpose and mission. Uh, Dash's stores have been serving the Buffalo area for 100 years. 100, this will be our 100th year. 100 years, congratulations. All right, and finally, we're going to introduce someone who probably needs no introduction for 
this room. So Maggie White is the director of the NGA Foundation. Maggie, tell us a little bit about the foundation and the importance of the inside of the NGA community. Yeah, so the NGA Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit arm of NGA. And our focus is really on helping independent grocers and the companies that serve them recruit, train, and retain talent. Um, and we do that through a number of established programs, but also through things like this bringing together education channel, um, looking to partners uh, where we can provide content and resources, and just continuing to look at um, what are the needs of the industry and how can the foundation play a role. So um, we have scholarships, we have student programs and relationships with the university coalition. We have a um, careers and online career center with the job board, um, but we're constantly looking to what else can we do, how else can we connect the dots to provide resources, to provide education, um, and to help you all attract the next generation. Now, much visibility is always put towards the kind of political part of NGA's mission, but the foundation is crucial and it acts as a really a force multiplier for a lot of the people in this room and their businesses as they continue to grow. So thank you panelists. We'll dive in. You know, when I put this panel up, I felt like every, everybody, everybody's going to know this already, but let's just set the mood a little bit. The Great Recession is real, and the burnout's real. And anybody that doesn't feel the burnout or is trying to ignore it and push past it is doing it at the risk of their teams, their companies, and the service they're trying to provide. The last two years, if we're just being you know, straight up honest with you, the business has accelerated, the expectations have gotten higher, we're not necessarily getting the same like grocery hero press that we were in the first few months of the pandemic. Our people are expected to respond nights, weekends, and it's hitting our frontline workers hardest of all. And not only that, customers' expectations haven't gone down. It's not like people are all of a sudden, you know what, I'd like to pay more for my groceries this week. Or I'd like to have less selection in the stores. Can I get like half the items I wanted in my basket? So you've got the customers that are frazzled, and they're dealing with their own stuff in their own life, right? So the turnover is real. Can you guys talk about uh, the story of Bob and Alexa? How is this impacting your stores? What have you heard? What have you seen? What's going on around? Yeah, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. I mean, people are really just kind of burned out. And any opportunity that we get to give them a break, I mean, in the Northeast, we tend to get snow. So when, when the storm is timed right and it looks like it's going to snow all day, it's, it's a great call. Um, it happened on a Saturday. I mean, how often do you get a Saturday off in the grocery business? But you know, we had a storm that looks like it was going to go all day. We said, you know, not worth it to, to risk you know, people driving in, um, you know, dealing with you know their their side streets that are plowed and all this stuff. Like, let's just let's give them a day off, and that went a huge huge way. Um, actually, before I flew out here on Friday, we had another little storm. We said, you know, we're just going to open at noon, and I mean, the rest of the day we didn't do a lot of business, but. You know, we had the one or two people that were, you know, upset that we weren't there at you know, 7 or 8 a.m., but I got three or four emails and phone calls from people that said, you know, thank you so much. My street got plowed at 11. I'm so happy that, you know, you, you really care about us. So, you know, we're feeling it, and when we find opportunities to, to give them a little bit of break or give something back to them, like, they're just so thankful because they, they really are maxed out. I'd like to have you. It's, it's definitely been difficult, you know, we have people, including myself, you know, working all over, you know, you're not doing maybe what you normally would do, you know, maybe one day I'm working in the deli just, just to give somebody a break, one of our employees who could really use it. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of cross training going on and making sure that everybody is getting what they need and it really is about coming together as one and, you know, not just letting one department or one person suffer because, you know, they maybe don't have a lot of staff or they've lost a lot of staff, or we haven't found the right fit for that department. You know, everybody from all over our company, whether they're from a different location, you know, everybody's willing to travel and work together when they know that if they're in a situation, they like to see that they would have the same reciprocated for them. And I think that gives them a really good sense of the, if somebody else has the opportunity to come help and relieve somebody who really needs it, that they would get the same respect. Let me do a quick poll of the audience. How many of you, in the last 30 days, felt burnt out of your job? Raise your hand. Probably, my unscientific estimate, maybe 60 percent, 70 percent of the people in this room. Now let me ask the question anyway. How many of you knew someone on your team or in your company that's been burned out in the last 30 days? Okay. 
probably almost 95 percent. Let me ask the audience a question and see if anybody wants to answer. Uh, what inspired you to come back to work the next day? What filled your cup? Yeah. My note payments. What's that? My <laughs> note payments. Your note payments. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So a little financial pressure can add clarity to the situation. I agree. Yes. My coworkers. Coworkers. That's a big one. The commitment to one's team, the commitment to quality, is one of the biggest things that drives people to come back to the office. It's also one of the biggest causes of burnout. When the commitment of our business becomes not to the business but to our coworkers, we push ourselves over and over and over again at that level. We don't want to let down the people who are counting on us. Anybody else? Yes. I can work with her, right? Like, 
I, I can train her, and she took a store that was underperforming in margin, and now she has it right, right where we're, we're targeting. So in a short amount of time, in like less than a year. And how old is the team member? She's probably like 40, yeah. 40s. And how long have they been at the company before? Were they a long time team member? Or they no, she was brand new from the outside. And had you ever worked in the brush industry before? Uh, no, pharmacy, 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 right? And, you know, we just liked, you know, the way that she, she had seen us on social media, she saw all the videos, she, you know, she liked the Gold Leaf was fresh thing, and, and I think we might talk about this a little bit later, but that's become a huge recruiting tool for us. So not only does it get our message out to our customers, but it gets it out to our prospective employees. So sometimes when I sit down with people, they already know what our, our goals are and what our vision is because they've checked us out on you know website, social, you know, they see me talking. So everything I start to say to them, they're like, yeah, yeah, we've heard this before, you know, watch their videos. But um, yeah, we're really trying to trying to find that right person. We're just not afraid to put in like a little extra in training if we think that they fit in with, with our overall mission. Awesome. Awesome. Let's talk about how I want to go dig in a little bit deeper when I double question idea how these how local folks are in a unique position. Maggie, we have had a lot of conversations about how local independent grocers present this massive opportunity for millennials and, and, and younger team members who want to make a huge impact. We put up some of these values, and I'm going to have each of you pick one of these that you want to speak to that resonates most with you. So we'll start with Maggie. What have you seen? Because in particular, we've got a lot of these students here for the case study competition and, and some of the other activities for the foundation. What resonates most with that demographic and, and that, you, that you're able to get that big impact for the foundation and to work with independence? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, one of the great things about this industry, in particular, these, these, these small businesses, these family owned businesses, um, is, you know, they're value driven um, and that really resonates with young people. They want to make a difference in the world. Um, they they want to be doing something that they see is is important. And um, you know, having a culture that um, really lays it all out there. Um, you know, what we're doing we need to know that what we're doing is important. We're serving our communities every day. And um, you know, being aware of the mission and, and what you're doing that and making that part of your culture. Um, I think is, is so valuable. And um, I love what you said about, you know, your social media presence and, uh, you know, you're not only are you communicating with your customers um, to try and get them to, you know, shop with you, but if your culture is evident in your social media, that is a huge recruitment tool. Um, and it, it can, you know, serve dual purpose if you, uh, Make sure your culture is apparent in everything you do. And I think Dash is, has a very fun culture, and they wear it on their sleeves. Uh, I'm not going to apologize to any of the Buffalo Bills fans here, but in the Dash's family are big Bills fans. So when Dash, when the Bills and KC were up against one another, Dash did a big campaign. They got a lot of coverage because they started taking all the KC masterpiece barbecue sauce out of the aisles. And they put a note in the aisles and said, we're taking KC down in the stores so that the Bills can take KC down in the field. <laughs> That's like the whole culture of Dash is having fun <laughs> every day, right? Can you talk a little bit about authenticity? Like, is it, there's just like the way that your company acts as a team. I, talk a little bit about that. I feel like definitely, you know, authenticity and culture, because they definitely go hand in hand. I mean, we have a really great history behind our stores, but you don't have to have that to be authentic. You know, you can have that without being a hundred or ninety-nine year grocer. It's about your relationship with your employees, with every person that walks through the door, no matter what their position is. You know, I don't care who you are in my store, in the store. Everybody knows everybody. Everybody has a relationship. You have you have that special bond between each person. You you understand these different personalities, and you're able to work with that and use that to elevate them within their own role within your company. And it's so important that, you know, when they walk through the door, they're seen and they're not just somebody walks through the door putting their name tag and their hat on and, and waiting on a customer because they are your lifeline in the store. They are the first, they are an image of yourself to your customer. So if they don't have the, the culture and vibrance that you want to bring to the people shopping in the store, it, 
you have nothing because that is definitely the most important thing. So it's really important to us that, you know, we have these great relationships with everybody who we work with and build these teams where they're cohesive and it's very easy to tell when you have a, a, a candidate who they could be amazing at produce, but they could also be a kink in the chain. And if they don't have the right attitude, then it doesn't matter what your skill set is because that could be the demise of an entire department, unfortunately. So. Um, I'm going to pass the ball to you. Uh, let's talk. I want you to talk impact and advancement. And I want you to tell the story about those high school students that missed their graduation and, and the impact that Geisler's had on their lives and then how they impacted Geisler's. Yeah, so the, this was one of the uh, highlights of my career. Um, I had a front end manager and a store manager in, in the store right across the parking lot from our office, which I'm in all the time. And they approached me, they were, they were a little unsure what the answer was gonna be, but they had this group of seniors, um, high school seniors, and then there was a couple of college seniors, and it was, I don't know, maybe like 15 different people that were all missing their graduation. So we, we wanna find a way to like give them something. So they had done all this research on how we could do a graduation for them inside the store. And we cleared out the whole like bakery department, we found, we taped out six foot, you know, chairs. We only invited, I think, their you know, parents. Um, and because the kids had worked together side by side, you know, they kind of sat in the front row and we uh, partnered with um, Pizzuto's, our wholesaler, and their charitable arm, Hometown Foundation, and all the resources they have to actually film it um, with multiple cameras at multiple angles and stream it live. And um, I was there with one of those, like, Gravity sticks handing out, you know, diplomas so I could be six feet apart. We had um, John Moss from this, uh, President of IGA uh, give a commencement speech, and it was it was just a fantastic event. And um, we got gowns and, and little, you know, individually wrapped cupcakes and everything for all the, all the kids. And they had a fantastic time. And, and out of that, we had a couple uh, college seniors that continue to work for us. And, and there's this one girl, Samantha, she had a degree in marketing, so we got her involved a little bit with what we were doing with Rosie and, and the app part with our, our new loyalty program. And over the pandemic, she, she realized, hey, like I really love you know, fulfilling orders and I love dealing with people and I love being hands-on. And you know, I don't think I want to do marketing. And I was like, hey, that's okay. You know, you can you can try produce and if you don't like that, you're gonna learn how to handle food safely, and then you could try, you know, the deli department, or if you want to come back to marketing, we have we have that available. There's so many facets within the supermarket, whether it's you know accounting, marketing, you know, that kind of stuff. And just through you know identifying her um, in that whole process, you know, I got to really know her. Um, it looks like she's going to stay with us, and you know, she wants to move up, and she has aspirations. It was like a really great tool, and a lot of those kids, you know, their parents and everything, it was a great community event. We got a lot of great press out of it, but it was just such a good way to give back, and um, all the other stores really appreciated it. We did something a little bit smaller scale for, for our other locations. I only had a handful of seniors, but this one had so many that, you know, those managers just really felt like they had to, had to give back and do something. So I, I had the easy job, I just said yes. Um, they did a lot of the, the heavy lifting, but it was a really great, great event for everybody. It was so inspirational to see this. I mean, talk about like what gets us out of bed in the morning, right? You know, th this was one of those things, mission driven. I mean, we, we saw this from our company. We forwarded this around the entire team. So now there's a vendor partner at Texas, and we're all fired up to go to work with these guys every day because of the way that they're investing in their people. And it's making us think about how we can pay that forward to the people in our community. So I, I want to throw out this topic, and it's a little controversial, but maybe maybe feel uncomfortable to hear this on this last point of advancement. I feel like the traditional, what I've observed, maybe, and maybe you've observed this too, the traditional mentality in grocery is that we look for lifers. Like we like to get them when they're young and kind of keep them in the business for the next 35, they can't get them for the next 40 years. Uh, but I actually think that the model is more that people may be with us for three or four years, or two to three years, or maybe even one year. Since. And that actually means we retooling our career pathing, and not around the idea that this is going to be something that's in the business for life, but maybe there 
there is something that, we, that does go that way, but there are a lot of people that spend less. I mean, right now, three years is, call it 10% of your career. What have you guys been seeing, and feel free any of you to hop in on this, about what the expectations are for some of these younger team members when they're coming into the company? They're not necessarily saying, this is my lifetime job, are they? No, definitely not. I mean, a lot of the, just kind of piggybacking on that last story, a lot of the, the college seniors, you know, they stayed on with us even though they were taking classes part-time because yeah. they loved working there. But because they were with us for multiple years, you know, they quickly picked up all of these different skills where we were able to move them into, you know, like assistant manager type positions or they could fill in for managers where we were, were, were down people and had staffing issues. And in a short amount of time, just a little bit of investment in their training, they can have a huge impact in your company. So I think a lot of times when we get a lot of the younger folks in, um, we think of them as you know, cashiers and baggers, and, and they're here for a couple of years. But you can identify those people that have that little spark and you know, just run with them. And sometimes you find someone that says, hey, I, I really love this, and like I may want to go get you know, some form of degree, but I, I like this business. And they will stay with you and maybe become a, a, a laborer. But I think it's much more common now that people are with you for small chunks of time, you really have to embrace that and say, listen, if, if we're, you know, if we're a step on your journey, that's okay. I just want you to take away something that, that helps you progress in your life. And if you approach it with that attitude, you know, you'll really get the most out of those people. Maggie, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, young people, and really people coming out of the last two years, expect more from their employers than ever before, right? You know, we've all lived through um, a really tough time, and people aren't willing to sacrifice their energy, their mental health for something that, you know, just isn't isn't worth it to them. And, and we see that with young people a lot. Um, but I love what you said about identifying those people that, you know, maybe they have the soft skills, maybe they have the interests. Um, you've got to invest in those people. You've got to identify them. And, you know, when I say invest in them, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to be spending a ton of money to do this. This is having a conversation with somebody, figuring out their interests, figuring out, you know, where, where would you go with the company if you could go in? Um, and those are the people that, you know, maybe they're there for three years and they make a huge impact, maybe they stay longer, but you've got to invest in those people where you see the spark and you see they have the talent and the skills that you need um, and work to grow them. And whether you're growing them to be a better person, a better employee somewhere else, you, you can't control that, you can't hang on to those people. But if you invest in them, you might find that they, they stick around. So we're going to unpack some of the stuff in the slide, but we have to kind of recalibrate a little bit. And I, I, I feel old when I say this, but if you were born in 1999, you were 22, 23 years old right now. So this is not the Nintendo generation or the Jurassic Park generation. This is truly the iPhone generation, right? They grew up immersed in Facebook. They grew up immersed in social media. They are digital natives. Can someone unpack this comment for us? In the first 36% of, of the next generation of employees believe they have the hardest, they have the hardest time in the workforce compared to those before them. And 65% of students believe they will end up in jobs that don't exist yet. What does that mean to you guys? And what have you been hearing when you're talking to that next generation of team? I think a lot of it just even has to do with the fact that they don't know what they have to do. And you know, you can be a big part of the stepping stone on their journey of life, honestly. I mean, you we take a lot of the kids in when they're in high school, and we know they might not be with us for life. Most of them will. They're going to go off to college, but they're also some of our most employed, important employees because we can count on them every time they're home on break, on summer recess. We count on them coming back from school and working, and all of them want to. And sometimes, some of them, while they're in school, they come back and they realize, well, I don't like that, and I enjoy working in this field, or you know, where can I grow within this company? Or they find a path that they didn't necessarily want. Or you know, you have, you've had them for do a lot of great work for you, and the time they work for you, and then they go off to be you know maybe a doctor or a lawyer. But that's okay. 
it's, you know, you help them in their developmental years become the person who they're going to be in the future. Opportunity in the fact that the younger generation doesn't know what they want to do. Uh, they don't know where they're going to land. Uh, there's a huge opportunity to, to help them find that uh, within our organizations for this industry. And when we say 65% of students here believe they will end up in jobs that don't exist yet, just remember the iPhone came out in 2007, right? Technologies like Instagram, Snapchat, all that stuff is recently over the last decade, and it just continues to get faster and faster and faster. So it's easy to say, you know, I, I'm not necessarily going to work where I grew up. I may not have to move. I can work remotely now, right? There are just huge changes and shifts that have been caused over the things that we've experienced in our lives over the last seven years. And so for this generation, they're kind of looking at where their puck may be going next. Okay. We're going to dig in a little bit on this. This talks about occupation, career development, benefits, what does younger generation employees really care about. And let's start off with occupation and what is, what gets them really fired up to come to work. So one of the things that we found, and, and I think you guys have, seen, you have talked about this a little bit in your business, is that some of the emerging technologies, rewards, website, social media, marketing, design, things that maybe were in the past, not necessarily part of the business, but are emerging as some of the most critical components of it, that's exactly what they are attracted to. Can you talk a little bit how you use your emerging technology programs to draw in that talent and how maybe they have taken it to the next level since you've done that? Um, yeah, so I, I think in terms of like the technology, we, we kind of very quickly in the last couple of years and we had plans to rip it out and replace it and then the pandemic just hit the accelerator on all that. So we've relied on a lot of you know, the younger folks in our company to um, help us get through that because to, you know, to Nick's point, like, they grew up with so much technology that they just naturally embrace it. And they're actually almost training some of our, our managers and some of the, you know, the older guard in our company saying, listen guys, it's not as complex as you think. And they're helping them kind of walk them through that. And they're actually finding ways to use it um, that we didn't even think of. So not so much on the, on the art side, but um, just on you know, the different use cases for it and how we're able to you know, go to market more efficiently. They tend to see like through the building box of the technology a lot faster and get us there quicker. You know, let's talk about this work-life balance one for a moment. I was talking to the CEO of Wholesaler and one of the things that they put in place is they're now offering uh, shifts for you to work, three 12-hour shifts or four 10-hour shifts because the majority of the workers that they're getting in the warehouse are actually gamers. And so the gamers want to be able to basically have like three to four interrupted days of computer gaming in their basement and then like do all of their work in a period of time. Have you guys seen or are offering any flexible solutions for time on, time off? How are you thinking about that and maybe being a little bit more lifestyle oriented? And I know it's like, you know, we all appreciate the hustle and grind of the grocery industry, like working every day, working the weekends, working the holidays, but at the same time, like, can we broaden the appeal or is there anything interesting that you guys are trying in your companies, testing out and thinking about? It's definitely hard because I mean, you have shifts and there's shifts you have to fill, and we don't even have the people to fill shifts. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of like uh, what we talked about in the beginning of helping one another out in other departments to give people a break. But, you know, like for myself, we already work a 10 hour shift and that's an average, a normal shift for us. So, you know, maybe it's, you know, if you're a salaried employee, you know, you know, get up early this day or, you know, you work hard, like just extending that, like, you know, me time for that. So talk about, talk about Dash's legendary English muffins and the investment the company's making in automation and how that is unlocking more time for the team. Yeah, so we, we make a lot of things from scratch, and um, one of our items that we're known for is our English muffins. It sounds funny, but they're amazing, and I hated English muffins. They're like bigger than the size of They're not a Mr. Thomas English muffin. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we, you know, we make them traditionally from scratch every night, and finding overnight bakers, or even still somebody who wants to work overnight, very difficult. And we use them also for our breakfast sandwiches, which 
we sell hundreds of them and we make them all day long. So we are literally to the point where we're taking the packages off the shelf because we can't make enough even just to make our breakfast sandwiches. So we are actually building a machine in France in order to automate a lot of the processes of it. So something that would maybe take three, three bakers, one that whole shift to make, will now be making probably four times as many with one person. Yeah. Um, so and so getting the same exact result. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like you're getting a, you know, a computer generated product. It's going to be the same, if not better, and more consistent. So, so this is the key idea, okay, automation, right? Getting the robots to do the robot jobs and the people to do the people jobs, right? When you look at what that next generation wants to do, they want to do the creative jobs. The ones where they can talk with people, where they can be in the store, where they can do pretty interesting content and posts. They don't want to be working in the salt mines of the bakery department at times, just cranking out English muffins for seven days a week. Now, that job has to get done, where we have to turn the wheel, we have to operate in the box. But are there ways to, through automation, unlock more time for people to do these creative jobs where they can elevate and think more strategically or operationally around the business? I think that's a really good point, because we're doing a lot of investing in automation, too, especially yeah. Yeah, we're, we're automating a lot more in our bakery department so that we can put more of that labor into like the creative part, whether it's how we decorate cakes or how we decorate cupcakes. And that allows people to kind of have the freedom to kind of play and have fun and then spend more time on the floor actually selling the thing that they helped create. So interacting with the customers. I just think that when we typically think about automation, we think about it as like a cost of goods or a labor saving or an operational exercise, but we don't necessarily always trace it back to the impact that it has on our people. And these investments in automation just pay off massively over time. But it's difficult sometimes to be able to do it do that with our investment. Yeah, um, and yeah. Add to that. Um, I think it's really easy to say when you talk about when you hear organizations offering flexible work schedules and remote work, it's really easy to say, well, we can't do that. We just can't do that as our industry. My business can't do that. Um, but I think an automation is a perfect example of if you think creatively, um, what, are there ways that we can provide some level of flexibility um, and, and play to your strengths? There are some creative ideas out there. Don't dismiss it just because we think that it's, you know, we can't do it in this industry. So let's put another big idea up there, which isn't on this slide, but I think has a huge impact too, sustainability. What are you guys doing from a sustainability perspective? And how are you communicating that either internally to your team and also externally to your customers? So um, we actually just went through a process with Radio Institute, which is a presentation we're doing tomorrow. And there's a lot of you guys want to check that out. A little show for that. Um, but you know, what I what I took away from that is that I was surprised a little bit at the amount of things that we were doing that we Associates. So we were one of the first um, supermarkets to do a uh, Brian's Energy program where we take all of our food scraps, take it around with the giant garbage disposal, and it goes to an aerobic digester at a farm where it's turned, it's turned into energy and we use it for um, fertilizer. And we get these reports like monthly and they kind of go in some random email. And we're like, hold on a second, like this is this is good stuff, right? Like we need to be talking about this. And through that whole process, we realized that um, we're doing a lot of the right things. I mean, yes, there's a financial impact with energy savings and that sort of thing, but there's also, you know, a, a cultural impact on our employees so that they know that we're doing the right things for the environment, and then also the recruiting side of it. So when you're when you're talking to folks, especially different generations, where sustainability is a huge thing for them, you know, they look at a grocery store and just think, wow, they're generating all this waste. And the reality is, is, compared to a lot of other industries, you know, I was watching glass bottles get thrown in the trash and you can see them over here, and I'm like, okay, that would get recycled, right? That plastic wrap would get recycled in my store, that carpet would get recycled in my store. And just telling telling those stories like actively on your website, making sure you don't don't talk about it only on the first day, um, so that everybody knows exactly what you're doing and having a, a source on your, your website or on your social media that people can go to it. That was actually a point in the, um, in the survey that we um, we piloted, ratio was like, how are we communicating this? Like, so I think you 
know, those things are really important to, to different um, generations. You gotta make sure that you're really just kind of like shouting those you know, to the ceiling. And I'm gonna kind of back up a second and say you can use technology to do it um, because we actually just upgraded our, our HR system. So we now have more communication tools to talk to our employees, whether it's you know, a note on the time clock, a note on the app um, on their phone, or um, being able to like blast emails out, emails out to them. And um, kind of to your point earlier that uh, we're rolling out the new scheduling app for them, which is gonna give them flexibility. So while we can't say, maybe you can work three 12 hour shifts, we can say, hey, we're gonna allow you guys to trade shifts around behind the scenes you don't have to talk to your manager because sometimes that's a little bit of a friction point, right? You catch the manager at the wrong time and you're like, absolutely not. So it's all done behind the scenes using technology and then the manager just has, just has to approve it. So that's kind of how we get around that. Yeah, so I love, it goes back to mission-based, telling that story, right? Improving some of those friction points with technology, automating that process, all that just builds up another company. I think all of us as stores right now over the next years, decades, our stores are going to become increasingly sustainable. Replacing those inefficient island freezers with new technology, and and we're doing those in some cases, for, in many cases, for financial reasons or because of maintenance reasons. But also, those are opportunities to tell our story and why we care about this. Right? We're, we're being purposeful about these decisions. Tell those stories internally and work through this. It is about sustainability. So uh, this was the some of the I think the dated perceptions about careers in grocery stores. Uh, what do you think a career in grocery means to you today? Now, you guys didn't necessarily go right back into business, right? You had, you had spent some time outside, uh, but you made a choice to work in the grocery industry. What is, what is your perspective on what this career means to you? Why did you do it? Well, for myself, um, I actually I was a team communications design, and I worked for a big graphic design firm out of school, and it was great, and I did get to do it. I wasn't always on my best but and I was dealing with people, but not on the level that I'd like to. I was just like to talk, and I'm very social. So I miss that daily interaction, being on the floor with not only the customers, but the employees, and you know, having that integration into the community. I miss that aspect, and that kind of brought me back here in the middle of the time, a new store, and the time in the world just worked out great, and I couldn't be happier that I'm back. So, you know, it's important that you relay that to your employees. Like with us, we have really big, um, really big prepared foods in our coffee shop. And it's, you know, there's the Hollywood versions that they show you in movies and other grocery stores, like it's boring, there's not in shelves. It is totally not that. You know, I feel like we have three people stocking our shelves, and that's it. That's like the smallest part. But, you know, we have people who might come in as cashier, and you don't know where that cashier is going to end up in your company. And I feel like for us, we have like we'll have some that you know they become our best meat cutter, or you know now they're the sous chef in our catering department. So there are so many more career paths and more attractive. And you know when you get those kids that are in high school, that is your opportunity to show them where they can grow, what they can do. Hey, do you want to go help them? You know, cut peppers. They need to help stuffing peppers back there. And then they kind of get that kitchen camaraderie. They realize, oh, like, this is really fun. Like, this isn't like, boring. This isn't what I thought this was going to be. So it's really important to when you see somebody take interest in these other departments, that you give that to not only their benefit but to your own benefit. You know, work together in harmony to mold these employees into maybe helping them dictate what they want to do. Awesome. <coughs> so we're almost at our time. What I want to do now is give the last word to Maggie to talk about some of the tools that the MJ Foundation is putting together. Because this is really just the opening of an ongoing conversation. We want to be talking to you guys. We're building some pretty awesome tools for you to use from here and beyond. Go for it, Maggie. Yeah. So I mentioned at the beginning, we were constantly looking for opportunities to provide new resources to help you guys solve these challenges, to help you address them. Um, so I want to talk about just a few programs and initiatives we've got going on. Um, we have our career center, grocerycareer.org. That is a job board where NGA members can post their jobs for free, and we actively market that to potential job seekers. One of the features that's really cool about the job board, though, is 
uh, you can create a company profile. There's you know a, a company listing. So even if you don't have job opportunities available at the moment, if you don't have you know job listings, you can go in and create that company profile so that those active job seekers that are finding our website that are coming to it can learn about your business. And that's a place to talk about your home, to talk about the things that you're doing in sustainability. Um, you know, through this website, you can create this awesome roster of all of the great companies in our industry um, and, and really start getting uh, job seekers excited about the opportunities and, and where they can potentially go. We're working on a couple of new tools um, later this year. Um, thanks to the awesome team at Rosie for working with me on some of this content. We are putting together a recruitment and retention toolkit, talking about some of these ideas, talking about some of the innovative ideas that we're seeing from other NGA members, from other industries. How are they recruiting, retaining top talent, and just really boiling down some of these tips and tricks and ideas and putting them in um, an easily accessible format um, for everyone to have access to. So that's coming later this year. We're working with Rosie and some other really great content partners um, to pull these stories together, to pull together um, all of our collective knowledge and resources and give you guys um, some really actionable ideas to take away. And then another piece of what we're doing, um, you know, I know a lot of the conversation about recruitment um, centers around wages and, and, and there's challenges with that. Um, we are working um, with a uh, labor analytics company to create a labor supply and wage dashboard. This is going to be an interactive tool that you can find on the NGA Foundation website. Um, that's going to give you some data points by geographic region um, about global wage, minimum wage, um, and just give you the tools to understand what you're working with. I think there's a lot of conversations about you know, minimum wage and you're looking at these big companies that are able to offer um, something that you know it just isn't feasible. We're trying to give you the data to understand you know what works for your region, what you should be doing, and, and benchmark yourselves against that. So that's another tool coming later this year from the foundation. We're really excited to just be able to provide you guys some information, some resources, and we want to do more. So uh, please don't hesitate to reach out um, to any NGA staff. Um, or to myself, uh, talk to me about the challenges you're having and how we can help provide resources, connect the dots, get you the, the tools, and uh, get you connected with the, the organizations and experts that can give you the information. Awesome. Thanks, Maggie. We want to uh, just invite all of you, all of our people leaders out there to come join us at our booth if you're passionate about talking about growth your culture and how we can continue to attract and inspire the next generation workforce. Visit us at our booth at the Technology Pavilion. Before we go, let's do a round of applause for our amazing <laughs>